thanks for coming. Uh, we're going to be talking to you today about um, certificate revocation. Uh, it sounds kind of boring to a lot of people, but it's actually very interesting, so I'm glad you all uh, came, came out to listen to us talk about it. Uh, we do want to encourage you to ask questions throughout, so don't be shy. If you have a question or a comment, please interrupt it at any time. Uh, so before I get into uh, certificate revocation on the web, and particularly OCSP stapling, which is what we're going to be talking about in depth today, I want to kind of set the stage here by uh, introducing Sally, the server operator. And you may be a server operator, you may be the owner of a website, uh, you may have things that keep you up at night that you worry about at 3 a.m. What Sally, the server operator, worries about is ways that attackers could break into her server. So she might have some out-of-date software that she's running somewhere on her infrastructure, something like a CMS that might have, oh, say, an RCE vulnerability, which has been known to happen. And uh, if, she, if she has some out-of-date software like this that's vulnerable, then an attacker who finds and exploits this vulnerability, even if just for a few minutes, could walk away with say, Sally's TLS private key. And that's basically the keys to the kingdom. If the attacker gets Sally's TLS private key, the attacker can impersonate Sally's site, and uh, basically all her users and user data are compromised. It's pretty much game over. TLS private key is you know, really what, what an attacker wants to get. Or Sally might have nightmares about certificate authorities screwing up. So in this example, I'm, I'm highlighting um, an incident in which Samantha uh, accidentally misissued some certificates during a testing procedure, but I'm not really meaning to pick on Samantha here. There are many, many other CAs who have had similar incidents, and they are not perfect organizations. No one is. And you might wonder, if you're Sally, the server operator, having a nightmare, you might wonder if a CA can accidentally yeah, misissue a certificate, maybe an attacker can come along and trick the CA into misissuing a certificate for your site. So this has been known to happen before, and this should be a very, very scary thought if you own a website, because this means that if any certificate authority screws up, they might, be, they might accidentally issue a certificate for your domain that you didn't authorize, and then there's a certificate floating around out there that can be used to, uh, that an attacker can use to prove that they are your site when they're not. Or there are a variety of misconfigurations or screw-ups that can happen, uh, that might be taken advantage of by an attacker to, to obtain a certificate for your domain. So in this example, sorry, the screenshot's a little small there, but in this example we have a researcher who basically found a DNS misconfiguration on a subdomain of msn.com. And as you can see, they took advantage of this misconfiguration to take over this domain. And once this, this research, researcher had gotten to this point, it would have been pretty trivial for them to obtain a certificate for this domain. And so even, if it, even after MSN had discovered and corrected this misconfiguration, there would still be this certificate floating around out there for this subdomain that had briefly been under the attacker's control. So the point is, when Sally, the server operator, is having her nightmares at night, she's worried about high-value data, like TLS private keys, which can be stolen in really any number of ways. And the question that we're addressing in this talk is, what should Sally do when there's a certificate? She knows there's a certificate floating around out there for her site with a private key known to an attacker. In other words, how does Sally revoke such a certificate so that web browsers no longer accept it as valid. This question of certificate revocation is a pretty fundamental part of the PKI system. It's pretty crucial, but it's kind of like this ugly word of the web that we don't actually know how to do certificate revocation well on the web. It's a pretty complicated, unsolved question. Today, I'm going to give you some more background about the mess that we have gotten ourselves into, which is certificate revocation on the web. Hopefully I, I uh, convinced you that it's an important problem, but I, then I'm going to tell you more about what the current state of the art is, what the solutions that we've tried are, and what went wrong. 
Then I'm going to tell you about stapling, OCSP stapling, which is a fairly promising solution for certificate revocation that might be able to solve all our problems, but is not particularly well deployed or well studied in the real world. And that's why we need site owners like you to get interested in this question of how to do certificate revocation properly so that you can figure out what it would take to get your infrastructure to support state-of-the-art revocation. Along those lines, uh, my co-presenter Dev is then going to take over. He's from Dropbox and he's going to tell you about their experience setting up their infrastructure for revocation and uh, how they used an experimental Chrome feature to kind of evaluate, evaluate how, their, how their revocation setup is doing in the real world. All right, any questions before I jump in here? Okay. So I thought we would get the sad stuff out of the way at the beginning. Um, and I'll tell you about all the stuff that didn't work. Um, but first, I'll give a little bit more background just about TLS and certificates in general, just to make sure the problem is clear here. So in a normal TLS handshake, you have a browser and a server. And the, server, the browser wants to send an HTTPS request, an HTTP request over TLS. So it begins by setting up a TLS connection, which is a little bit complicated, but at a, at a bird's eye view here, the client says, hello, I want to speak TLS, uh, provides some parameters that it supports. Uh, in this example, it's using a TLS extension called SNI, or server name indicator, to uh, indicate that it wants to connect to the site called example.com. And so the server says, great, I'm example.com. I have a certificate proving that I'm example.com. And it provides that certificate to the client, which then begins the ridiculously complicated procedure of certificate verification. So given this certificate for example.com, the client says, okay, does this, uh, does this have a chain of signatures that chains up to um, a certificate authority that I trust? Is the certificate valid uh, date-wise? Is it expired or not yet valid? Um, do, is the certificate actually for the correct name that I requested? Things like that. So it's, uh, it's, it's, this is kind of skimming over a lot of detail here, but this is kind of the, an example of what a client might check during the process of certificate verification. So this is, this is the normal good case. This is what, when, when everything's going right. But remember that what we're interested in with POC is when an attacker has a private key for a certificate for the domain. So the client is not actually talking to the real example.com. The client is talking to an attacker who has a certificate claiming to be example.com. The problem is that everything to the, to, the, to the browser looks exactly the same in this situation. It says, I want to talk to example.com. The attacker provides a certificate proving that it is example.com. And the client goes through certificate verification checks, which come out showing that the attacker is example.com. In this basic TLS setup here, we don't have any way to communicate to the browser that it shouldn't accept this certificate. From the, from the browser's perspective, this attack certificate looks just like a legitimate certificate for example.com. So what we need is a way to communicate to the browser that this certificate it should no longer be considered valid, that it has been revoked. And there's quite a bit of history here, things that have been tried that didn't work out so well. The most basic of these attempted approaches is called certificate revocation lists, or CRLs, which is basically exactly what it sounds. The client periodically contacts certificate authorities and asks these certificate authorities for lists of certificates that have been revoked. It downloads these certificate revocation lists, and then when it has a certificate that it's trying to validate, it checks it against these certificate revocation lists to make sure that it hasn't been revoked. So when Sally finds out that there's an attack certificate floating around for her site, she goes to her CA and she says, hey, I want to revoke this certificate, and uh, the CA adds it to its CRL, so that clients will download the CRL and not accept that revoked certificate anymore. So as you can probably imagine, this is not the most robust scheme, and it's also quite expensive. And it turns out that in the real world, browsers are just not willing to download these huge CRLs regularly. They're too big, the performance cost is too high, and it's kind of a, um, it, it's kind of a bad trade-off for browsers because most of the, the data that they're downloading 
is not actually going to be relevant to them. It's for certificates they're never going to see. Why do they need to download uh, a list of every revoked certificate in the universe uh, when they're not going to see most of those certificates? So it's a lot of wasted, uh, wasted data. There's a variation on this idea of certificate revocation lists, um, where browsers basically, uh, browser vendors compile lists of revoked certificates that they care about and push those down to their browsers. So for Chrome, this is called CRL sets. Mozilla has one CRL. Uh, these are sort of like browser curated CRLs. So they're supposed to be smaller, only containing, say, high value certificates or intermediate certificates, things that are sort of uh, more bang for the buck for browsers to download. Um, well, the, 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 oh, sure, yeah, the question was how does this work for smartphones where you are in a more constrained environment? Um, it basically works the same way. These are not, uh, unfortunately, I don't, I should have pulled out some numbers, but I don't have any numbers, but the, these are designed to be like, downloadable by, by clients like smartphones. So, um, you know, there are not that many intermediate certificates out there, for example. Um, so if you were to distribute a list of all the revoked intermediate certificates, it actually just wouldn't, wouldn't be that big. And it's, it's um, tractable for a smartphone. But, you know, this doesn't work for, this doesn't scale. Like, the, you know, if, if um, Joe's Pizza Shop has a certificate that, that they, that, um, they want to revoke, they basically have to go to the browsers and convince the browsers to um, accept their certificate in these browser-specific revocation lists. So it doesn't really scale well for all the certificates on the, on the, uh, on the internet, and it also doesn't work for non-browser TLS clients. This is a very browser-specific solution. As I was talking about CRLs, an alternative might have occurred to you which also occurred to some other people who invented the Online Certificate Status Protocol, or OCSP. So with CRLs, you download a whole bunch of revoked certificates, and when the browser is validating a certificate, it checks if that certificate appears in a CRL. But in OCSP, we instead do an online check for the particular certificate that we're interested in. So when the browser has a certificate for a site that it's trying to validate, it can go ask the certificate authority, is this particular certificate valid? And the CA will give an answer for that particular certificate. So the browser doesn't have to download all this information about certificates that, does, that it doesn't care about. Um, it just has to ask the CA about this one particular certificate that it does care about because that's the site that the user is trying to connect to right now. Um, I imagine in your mind you're thinking like there are so many things wrong with this, and there are. Um, one of them is that you've now introduced like a round trip on every handshake. Um, because before the, before the HTTP request is sent, during connection setup, we have to go in and ask the CA, is this certificate okay? Interestingly, this is actually not as expensive as it used to be. Um, in 2012, 2013, there were studies showing that this introduced hundreds of milliseconds of latency. More recent studies suggest it's more like tens of milliseconds, and that's attributed uh, to better OCSP infrastructure, um, certificate authorities using CDNs to catch their OCSP responses. So this is no longer the ridiculously exorbitantly huge performance penalty that it once was, but it still is an extra round trip on every, round trip on every handshake. And even if you're willing to accept this round trip, Maybe you don't want the CA to know every website that you visit. Just because a CA has issued a certificate for a site doesn't mean that that CA should learn every time a, a user goes and visits that site. So there's a pretty big privacy problem here. And finally, there's a reliability problem. It puts the CA in the critical path here so that if the CA is down, what does the browser do when it can't get an OCSP response? It turns out that CAs go down sometimes, and because of that, browsers have been forced to accept the reality that we can't fail open. Or sorry, no, we have to fail open. We can't fail close. So you know, CAs go down. We can't put this, we can't put this extra round trip in the critical path. Browsers have basically um, agreed, for the most part, upon 
failing open. If an OCSP, if an OCSP request fails, browsers will generally go on and continue the connection just like normal. So these are problems that um, can potentially be fixed using a modification of OCSP called OCSP stapling. This is pretty promising because we want to tackle these problems of avoiding this round trip, improving reliability, not relying on putting the CA in the critical path, and protecting privacy so that CAs don't, don't learn about every site that, uh, that, that a user visits in a browser. In OCSP stapling, we sort of turn things around. Instead of the browser talking to the CA to ask if the certificate is valid, the server does. Every so often, the server goes to the CA and says, can you please give me a signed message stating that my certificate is, is valid and not revoked? Then the server staples this, this signed message from the CA when it delivers the certificate. So the browser doesn't have to go and ask the CA in the critical path if the certificate is valid because it has this, uh, this OCSP response, this signed response from the CA saying that the certificate has not been revoked, stapled in the connection there. This is what we call OCSP stapling. And you can see it has a number of nice properties. We don't have that round trip in the critical path. The server can kind of query periodically and cache the responses that it has. Uh, it improves reliability. Um, did I do these out of order? No, yeah, okay, we avoid round trip. Um, it improves reliability in the sense that the CA is no longer in the critical path of what, this, what the browser has to talk to on every handshake. Also has a nice property of reducing traffic on the CA because the server kind of queries once and then serves that response to many clients instead of each client querying the CA every time. And it protects privacy because the browser does not contact the CA as part of connection setup. Of course, it doesn't solve any of our problems because it can be trivially bypassed. So if, you have, if, you're, if you're an attacker and you have a certificate that you're using um, to man in the middle a victim, you're just not going to staple an OCSP response. And because browsers don't require stapled OCSP responses, uh, Browsers aren't going to care that you didn't staple an OCSP response and you just got away with using a revoked certificate. So basically this is like a weird thing where uh, if, if the bad guy chose to report that their certificate was revoked, then uh, the browser would not accept the certificate, but the bad guy is just not going to choose to accept that the certificate's revoked. What we really want is a way to tell the browser that this certificate should not be allowed unless it comes with a fresh staple OCSP response. And that's basically what must staple is. It's a flag in a certificate saying that the certificate must be provided alongside a stapled OCSP response and should not be accepted as valid, as other, as valid otherwise. So if an attacker comes along and recovers the private key for a must staple certificate, they're not going to be able to actually put that to use Unless, uh, unless they can also provide a proof that the certificate hasn't been revoked. You may have also heard of must staple as the TLS feature extension. Um, these are both kind of jargony terms, but I'm just throwing that out there in case you um, heard of it as one or the other. It's also conceptually similar to a short-lived certificate, and I'm not gonna talk too much about short-lived certificates. I'll kind of leave this as a thought exercise. Um, but if you have a certificate that is only valid for a week, and every week you renew your certificates, versus a must-staple certificate where your OCSP response, the, the certificate itself might be longer lived, but the OCSP responses are only valid for a week or less. Those actually have similar properties. They also have um, somewhat similar operational and deployment challenges. So must-staple is supported by Firefox today. And you can go to Let's Encrypt and, um, and give a, uh, get, a, get a must staple certificate today. So you may be wondering, why are we all not rushing out to buy must staple, buy or, uh, or request must staple certificates right now? Um, and why are all browsers, like Chrome, not rushing out to implement must staple right now? The answer can be summed up in this scary 
Uh, this is Chrome's certificate error page. This is what happens when we encounter an error on, cer uh, on certificate verification, and in particular, this is what happens if a site is using a must staple certificate, but screws up and does not deliver a valid stapled OCSP response. We think that if everyone were to go implement and turn on must staple today, users would see a lot of this. And we really don't like showing these in Chrome. It's a bad UX. You know, the user just wants to do what they want to do, look at their cat videos or whatever. They're instead seeing this. Most users don't know what this means. Uh, they're mostly looking for the, like, okay, let me just do what I want to do button. Um, so it trains users to click through. The more of these we show, the more users get trained that these are just sort of weird errors they see sometimes and they just have to click through them. And that ends up harming the ecosystem in the long run because when users see these, they should know that this means there's something really fishy going on. So we don't want to go implement must staple right away because we think that would cause a lot of this. And Deb's going to tell you a little bit more about, um, about why we think that. In short, it's, it's actually pretty hard to deploy OCSP stapling reliably today. It's also, in addition to being kind of difficult to deploy properly, it's also just kind of difficult to know whether you've done it right. You know, how do you really know, if, if you turn on OCSP stapling in your server, how do you know that you're actually reliably delivering fresh, valid OCSP staples on every connection? How do you know that you're not causing a bunch of errors? And how do you, how do you know that um, clients or networks are actually allowing those to be validated properly? And again, Deb will go into a little bit more detail about, about what I mean here. But this difficulty of measuring OCSP stapling is why in Chrome we introduced this experimental feature called expect staple. Instead of must staple, it's like expect staple. We like, we're not going to require that you have a staple, a staple OCSP response, but we really expect you to. Um, and it's this experimental feature where you can opt in on this baked in list of sites in Chrome. And once you've opted in your site, we do basically a report only version of must staple. So if we, uh, if we connect to your site, and your site is opted in, and that, that connection doesn't come along with a valid OCSP response stapled to it, then Chrome will send a report to your server or to a location you're choosing indicating that there was a problem. So it's sort of like a trial run version of must staple. We won't actually fail connections uh, if you aren't delivering OCSP responses properly, but we will, um, we will send you a report so that you learn about failures in your infrastructure. Okay, so um, with that, Deb is going to now give you some background about um, how Dropbox has been using OCSP stapling and expect staple. All right, hi. Uh, I'm Deb. Uh, thanks, Emily. That was great. Now I'm all nervous because I'm not that good a speaker. But uh, how many people work in AppSite here? All right, so you all know you can empathize. So everything she said was the theory. Uh, as you all know, the world is horrible. Uh, <laughs> everything's terrible. So, uh, so we're going to talk about what we noticed uh, trying to use this. All right, so out of the box, uh, you know, OCSP stapling support in either uh, your Nginx or Apache install doesn't really work very well. First issue we'll, uh, when we started looking at this was uh, OCSP responses are fetched uh, lazily after startup. So if you set up Nginx to use uh, OCSP stapled OCSP responses, it won't actually, it can't actually staple uh, OCSP responses in the first request. When you make the first request, it will go and ask the CA, hey, give me the OCSP response to staple, which you can imagine is not really great, especially at our scale where we have lots and lots of Nginxes restarting and moving around all the time. So this starts. The other thing is, uh, if the responses expire, uh, Nginx doesn't refetch them in time. Like, OCSP responses are only valid for a week. Uh, Nginx doesn't remember to refetch them in time. Uh, there are a lot of other bugs in, uh, in similar servers. Uh, even CAs actually have bugs. Uh, let's encrypt, this is a bug in Let's Encrypt that the Let's Encrypt developer, uh, to their credit, filed, saying that the current OCSP response uh, generation strategy is not good for actually deploying OCSP stapling because way too often the responses would just fail to be generated. So, you know, for something like Dropbox, this is not great. We want something robust and reliable. 
right? Like we want to be robust against CA or servers, be, uh, the certificate authority servers being down. It's like, you know, we use Digicert, Digicert is great, but uh, Dropbox's uptime is way higher than Digicert's uh, uptime. Like Facebook's uptime, way higher than Digicert's uptime. Like this is not, uh, this is not, we can't rely on these CA's uptime. We also don't want to DOS the uh, CA by just like repeatedly asking it for those CSP responses. This is actually another risk that has appeared in the past. And uh, and as I talk about, we also want to, if the CA is making some mistake, right? Like, I'm not making this up. Literally during development, we try to ask the CA, uh, one CA in particular, like, hey, can you give us the OCSP response? And the OCSP response we got back was for some completely unrelated to me. Which, you know, if you're writing code, you should plan for that. <laughs> write those if conditions around it. Uh, and uh, and start alerting if like we are not getting a new OCSP response in time. So here's the architecture of what we ended up doing at Dropbox. Uh, we wrote a new service uh, for OCSP's uh, uh, response fetching that just continuously talks uh, every you know every X minutes to the certificate authority and fetches the OCSP response and checks whether the OCSP response is valid, is for the right website. Uh, and all these other checks that we want to do, and uh, and then commits it to our secret service. Nginx talks to the secret service every uh, uh, every time it reloads and uses the new refetched correct OCSP response. And so you're able to tell Nginx, hey, use the OCSP response that I've put it in this file. And uh, and it loads, like similar to how it will load the SSL search from our secret service, it also loads the OCSP response from our secret service. Uh, one quick side point, this sort of service where Nginx or your Apache or something is able to reload secrets is pretty useful in general. Uh, there's a paper uh, a few months back about you know how we need to rotate session ticket encryption keys. Uh, you know, creating this service allows you to rotate session ticket encryption keys also, or allows you to rotate the HPAMs. There was a paper like a year or two years back where the HPAMs no, uh, no one rotates and that's fine. So being able to do all these things, uh, this service where you can reload secrets in Nginx is very valuable. So we didn't actually create this service just for OCSP. We, we had many users for it for security. All right, so I was thinking about showing the code, but that wasn't as fun as, uh, I think, comments. As we all know, comments and code are more fun. <laughs> so so we're going to go through the code via comments. Uh, hopefully this works out. I haven't done this before. So, uh, <laughs> but feel free to ask questions. Uh, all right, so. All right, this is too small then. Uh, yeah, so the uh, the first thing it does is create a temp file to write the OCSP response. The reason we want to do this is because we often get invalid responses. And so we want to check and ignore these invalid responses. So first create a temp file to fetch the OCSP response. Then we fetch, but don't during the fetch verify the OCSP response. Uh, because the OCSP, OpenSSL OCSP command will return non-zero even upon success. So you can't really trust the response of the OpenSSL OCSP command. It also, like during testing and working with this, it looks like the OpenSSL OCSP command is very uh, iffy about the order of arguments. So after a lot of work, we figured out the exact the order of arguments for these 10 arguments. And we have a gigantic command saying, don't touch the order. <laughs> like, or if you do, don't. <laughs> like, make sure you test it properly. Uh, and then, uh, and so we learned that separately, if we call the OpenSSL OCSP verify command, it always exits with return status zero, regardless of whether the response was valid or not. So what we ended up doing was uh, grepping the output for the word OK, uh, which is uh, which is you know not the most robust thing. But as far as we can tell, everyone does this. Like there's no other uh, option. Uh, so now hopefully like this journey in comments is convincing you why we need something like XPEX table and not must table. Like I can't go to my uh, infrastructure team being like, you know, this solid piece of code, we're going to turn on must table. <laughs> so, uh, so XPEX table is really important here. Does that make sense? Uh, we, we can share the code if, you, uh, if people are interested. But it's actually very simple code. Just be aware of all these gotchas with OpenSSL and be very cautious. That's really the main high level comment, right? As far as I can tell, this is well known, like, you know, mailing lists and like... I mean, it will break our script now, so... <laughs> no, uh, we should, we should, sorry. But like, it looked like this was like expected like behavior, so uh, I don't know. Uh, okay, so we deployed this, and now what was our experience like deploying it on www.dropbox.com? So, 
Dropbox deployed OCSP stapling back in February. Uh, this was before XX staple uh, discussions with Emily. But uh, I would encourage everyone to deploy OCSP stapling because it's just a big performance win. Uh, Firefox, in our case, was fetching, doing that extra round trip with our service, uh, with the CA service, for our uh, anytime it did a certificate handshake with Dropbox. And just OCSP stapling kills that extra round trip. So it's actually a good performance win turning it on, which is also a good argument to yeah, use sure. with uh, other engineers inside the company on why we want to deploy OCSP statement. After we turned this on, surprisingly, our monitoring uh, did not indicate actually that many failures at searching OCSP responses. Uh, we actually saw a lot when we were working on this code, but uh, once we turned this on, like over the last year, uh, we haven't seen that many errors. Uh, it might be that, uh, you know, DigiCert RCA has really good uptime, and as Emily mentioned, there has been a lot of work on improving these OCSP responders. And another theory I have, uh, this might be completely wrong, is the day we deployed OCSP stapling, uh, all these uh, Firefox browsers that were hitting DigiCert asking, hey, give me an OCSP response, stopped. Like all these clients distributed all over the world who used to ask DigiCert's OCSP responder for an OCSP response, stopped because they had the stapled response that we were sending them. So I think that also affected the uptime and the reliability of the DigiCert Dropbox OCSP responder. All right. Chrome preloaded, uh, like rolled out this XXSQL feature uh, and preloaded Dropbox.com in Chrome 54. And uh, Chrome 54 went stable in uh, mid-October. Usually it takes a week for the world to update. And, uh, and we started collecting data. Uh, we started getting these reports. And most of the data that I'll be talking about is from the month of November. Uh, if you do get uh, uh, into this, uh, as Emily mentioned, we're hoping we'll convince you to start using this also. If you do get loaded into the uh, XFX staple list in Chrome, one mild issue in uh, 54 or 55, I think, I don't know whether this was fixed, is that uh, Chrome didn't send a content type JSON header and the default, pretty much any web server's default like give me body function call, in our case it was like response.body, uh, sorry, request.body, uh, would return an empty string because there was no content type. So you had to do like request dot get bytes or something. Uh, but we actually just ended up rewriting an nginx to like force content type of uh, application based on. So that works. All right, are you all with me before we dive into the data? All right, so the JSON report, the uh, expect stable report from Chrome, has uh, has a bunch of fields. The first field is date time. This is the time that the client was on. Like this is the you know if the client is connecting on the browser is connecting on like 13 November blah 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 second hour, it will be that time. The response status is what Chrome thought of the OCSP response. It might be like hey, I expected a stapled OCSP response, but there was none. Our error response that the return stapled response was actually wrong. Like it was saying uh, uh, it was not valid for this connection or uh, invalid date, which says that you know the OCSP response is only valid for a week, and the current it was older, or in from the future, uh, which is another type of error. And uh, there's a bunch of other errors. Uh, you can see the spec uh, for more details. And the report also includes the actual OCSP response. So uh, you know when the response status is not missing, the actual OCSP response that Chrome used for uh, making these decisions is included in the report. All right, so uh, how do you do the data analysis? Uh, you run this command, uh, open SSL, OCSP, text inside uh, with the, the OCSP response you got in the JSON report. It will give you this output, uh, you know, the OCSP response data is successful, this is the basic uh, OCSP response, and the field I want to point out is like, this update was October 12th, next update October 19th. So this means the OCSP response was valid from October 12th to October 19th. Connecting on October 15th, this will be considered a valid OCSP stapled response. If you are connecting on October 25, this won't be a valid OCSP response. Does that make sense? All right. So now the data collection is uh, simple, right? Like we look at this uh, this update, next update fields, and say, what? How does this compare to the date time field? And that will tell us if it's an invalid date. Hey, this byte was invalid, or how much off it was from the valid date. So when we started doing this analysis, the vast, vast majority of errors that we saw are missing. Uh, and this is because of, uh, we believe, TLS proxies, uh, antiviruses, or all these like TLS proxies that people have installed. 
where uh, they have a local root, and so they see the uh, data in the Dropbox uh, SSL connection at the proxy, and then have a TLS connection with the user's browser. But since the user's browser is running Chrome, it expects the it has the expect staple preload for Dropbox.com, and it says I don't see a OCS response. So we get an error saying missing, missing. But we know this is uh, TLS proxies because the search chain is missing in the uh, uploaded report. That basically tells us this is a local root. So we are pretty con uh, confident that this is TLS proxies. And this won't actually be a problem in the real world if we turn on must table, because Chrome and any uh, browser will just ignore OCSP must table if, uh, uh, if it's a local uh, TLS proxies certificate. Ne nearly all the remaining errors were invalid date, uh, that the stapled OCSP response is not valid for the current client's time. Uh, as I showed earlier with the example, OCSP responses are typically valid for a week, let's say November 5 to November 12. And anything after November, like if your current time is after November 12, uh, you will say invalid date. Or if your current time is before November 5, you will again say invalid date. And so we could look at the data that we are seeing. We could see the time we are, the Chrome included in the report, compare it with the OC data in the OCSP response, and say how much off was it. And so we started doing that. Uh, With the what? Yeah, so it's valid for a week. Yeah, yeah, so it, tomorrow. Yeah, so the question was, are we worried about uh, any problems due to internationalization? Or like, you know, we are in America, someone is like 24 hours ahead and like news I guess that's what also you're asking. Uh, the OCSP responses are valid for a week and are usually backdated. Like they aren't, uh, we don't start getting the new responses as soon as they're issued we get them like a day later or two days later, I think. So, so they're usually fine. That but uh, but it's, yeah, hold on to that part because there are related problems. So we looked at all the errors, and uh, I'm only showing data from the fifth percentile to the 95th percentile because like there were some clients that had like three-year-old blocks, and then your host, right? Like there's really nothing. There's no HSTS, there's no HPKT, like, let's just forget about it. So. Uh, so, so like the fifth to ninety-fifth percentile is like the vast majority of the errors that you're seeing. So that's the main data I want to focus on. And so what that means is that you know, looking at this graph, you can see that less than five percent of errors were with clients who had clocks more than seven days behind, because the x-axis is minus seven here. And uh, less than five percent of errors were clients with clocks who are more than one day ahead. I want to point out this is one day here and minus seven here. And so fifth to ninety fifth percentile. Right? Does the graph make sense? Minus seven to one day. All right. Uh, same CDF, but now let's go through the actual graph that we saw. So ninety five percent of uh, the remaining errors, client clock is maximum behind a week by a week. Like the client clock clock is actually behind the valid OCSP response. So the client is seeing an OCSP response from the future. Fifty percent. If you go plus or minus one day of validity, uh, fifty percent of errors are covered. And seventy-five percent of the errors are covered in the like three days behind, one day future scenario. So like vast majority of errors are covered within like just off by a few days here and there. So this is a common problem. TLS has always had this problem: client clocks being wrong. Is, is an old problem in TLS. And this data that we are seeing matches what previous studies have seen around like TLS, uh, you know, TLS timestamp and like verifying <coughs> TLS certificates and errors to those. Uh, one thing I want to point out, as Emily said, right, like week long short lived certificates is very similar conceptually to a CSP statement. What expects table let us do is measure if we did week long certificates, what sort of errors would our clients see? and without actually impacting any of our users in terms of downtime. So we know that if we tomorrow try to switch to week-long certificates, so many users will just like hit errors all the time, because their client clocks are not actually within the like expect acceptable bound of a week. And in our case, we have HSTS turned on with include subdomain, so you can't bypass the warning either, so that would be really sad. Yeah, it's fine. So this is happening at the TLS layer, so it's kind of hard to figure out uh, as which is the user, like what percentage of users and what percentage of connections because it's only Chrome. Like, yeah, so it happens at a completely different layer. We know the pure numbers and we can make a guess, 
unfortunately, I haven't confirmed with uh, all the right people whether I can share those numbers. So sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so this is a known problem. Uh, Adam Langley and others have proposed this protocol called rough time, which is this distributed consensus consensus algorithm, so that all browsers can decide this is the correct time, even if the client clock says it's you know uh, sometime something else. Uh, let's use this for SSL verification. Like users will change their client clocks to get Candy Crush working. This is not like I'm not even making this up. This is literally a known phenomenon. So. So like that should not break uh, OCSP stapling, and that should not hold back short-lived TLS certificates. Uh, so what are the solutions? Browsers could enforce a correct time. Uh, it's already a problem because insecure time services allow bypassing HSTS, HPKP, and all these mitigations. And uh, browsers are working on this, the rough time project by Google. Uh, you can Google for that if you're interested in learning more. Uh, I personally, <laughs> because I like to have fun, uh, think that is it really a problem if a certificate like we have an OCSP response saying that this certificate is valid from the future? Like if a CA has gone come in from the future and told us this private keys or certificate is still valid, is it valid now also? Right? Like, uh, from the past, I can understand being a problem, but like hey, you know, today is uh, uh, 24th Jan and the CA tells me like this certificate is valid from Feb 1 to Feb 8, I should probably accept it for today also. Is is my thing. this is an ugly hack? I you know, first one to <laughs> acknowledge this is an ugly hack, but uh, but the vast vast majority of errors are due to client clocks being behind the OCSP response. Maybe like people have uh, batteries that are running out, or like you know their their game is going to expire, so they move the clock back. I don't know, but but like fixing those errors and helping us deploy OCSP would be really cool. Uh, there were a bunch of few uh, there were a few other errors that I wanted to quickly call out. Uh, we saw a bunch of errors where the, it was a local root, it was a TLS proxy, but the OCSP response status was invalid. So if you're running, uh, so what this meant was the stapled OCSP response was not valid, and it was a local root. So if you know someone or you are running a TLS proxy, uh, your man in the building TLS, uh, please also throw away the OCSP response that we are stapling. Please don't <laughs> continue passing it along. <laughs> it quite unnecessarily screws up our <laughs> measurements. Uh, Finally, before we end, uh, quick call to action. Y'all, you know, are in are secure websites are probably intimately aware with the TLS configurations of all the websites you run. Uh, we would love your help with deploying OCSP must stable, deploying uh, short-lived certificates, and that needs a lot more data. So uh, consider implementing OCSP stapling in your servers. Uh, it's a performance win, so it's not. It, it's a pretty convincing argument to make because it helps performance also in addition to long-term security improvement. And enroll in the expect staple preload list. Uh, also, like finally, because Scott is here, and I'm going to call him out right now. Uh, you know, something like report URI.io supporting expect staple reports would be awesome, because then no one has to rewrite this again and again. Uh, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and you know, as I've said, right? Like right now, it's this dirty word. Revocation is a dirty word, and we don't talk about it. But like that can't go on forever. We, we need to start talking about as a community. What are we going to do? And so, so like collecting this data will be massively helpful. And uh, you know, Dropbox paid for my flight here, uh, so, uh, and uh, Google paid for Emily's flight here and hotel, and same for me. Uh, so yeah, we're all. Uh, Dropbox is hiring in our product security team. Uh, Google's hiring. Google Chrome's hiring. Uh, if you're wondering how I'm advertising for both, you know, if you go work for Chrome security, you'll probably help. Dropbox security also. Uh, uh, just don't go work for Google Drive. That, that's all I ask. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and that's it. Yeah, cool. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, reports at uh, browser and What is in a report? What data is there? It's the date time, the actual uh, response itself, and what was the error at a high level. Reason. It also has the certificate chain and stuff, but those are the main high level things. Yeah. Sorry, you have a question? Uh, just shout it out, I can repeat it. Yeah. Is there any revocation for the OCSP uh, signature itself? So it is valid for seven days. If it's not uh, revoked, and someone gets that and, and I don't think, I think this is like their turtles all the way down, sort of, like, at some point. Like, some amount of risk we accept, yeah. Unfortunately, but yeah, I think, but but the window there is short, right? Like, it's like three days, two weeks at the most. Yeah. Uh, 
Click on average. It's, so since it's totally, it, the whole thing is valid for a week. We are talking about at most, like on average, a three, four day window, right? So, uh, so hopefully, uh, that's, that's good. It's better than two years, I think. It's right. <laughs> Did you say the code is open now for your um, all the open SSL commands are really hacky and horrible and I have no CSP cache primer written bash? Are you can you I'm happy to share it with you just in your yeah, uh, right. this open sourcing is it's not really very interesting because it's very tied to the secret. Like the hard part there is the secret service and getting in the next to reload secrets and stuff, which is just like how we do infrastructure. Uh, but the actual OCS it's just a bunch of commands, so I can share it, it's not really. You mentioned actually this uh, Nginx and secret service. Could you describe at a high level what you guys do um, to get the correct secrets into Nginx? If you know. So Nginx just have a, has a command for just reloading the config. And so if you send that signal to Nginx, uh, if the file with the secrets has been updated, it will just reload that file. So so you just have to do it with the appropriate in the appropriate times with the right monitoring and after you have changed the secrets and stuff. So it's actually not hard, it's just a bunch of uh, like duct taping and like uh, pipe work that you have to do, but it's yeah. But it's like nginx dash s reload, and that's yeah. like who knows? Yeah, that like you know, did it. So yeah, so you do know when a certificate has been misissued because the cert transparency log will show. So like the service crt dot sh will. Uh, uh, if you want to, yeah. But there are services like CIT.sh, Facebook has a service that will tell you, I don't know, Jim, do you know the name of that service? Uh, okay, yeah, so developers.facebook.com slash tools slash CD will tell you, you can tell like, hey, I'm the owner for this domain, tell me whenever a new certificate is issued, and then you can know if someone misissued it. Whether you got hacked and someone stole your existing private key, that there isn't like, how do you know whether you've been hacked, right? But that's just a... I would recommend moving your private key also to some hardware back like lockdown service if possible. But yeah, that that's much harder. You can't really know. But usually you know, right? Like people do this those breaches all the time. <laughs> Actually, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> I have to mind. Um uh, Emily mentioned the, the, the dependency and not showing too many fail pages and that's why it's not implemented. And a lot of, it's very complex, right? It's chicken egg. It's a lot of things need to come together. The CA need to provide the information for the state link, the browser needs to support it. What's the order of things? What's the, all the CAs need to offer the service? Do all the browsers support the reporting? Do all the web servers need to enable it? Does it all need to come at once or is there a certain order in which this needs to be? I'm going to take it or should I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a, I'm a never-ending optimist in security, so I mean it has to happen step by step, right? I think our presentation clearly indicates our bias towards what's the order. I think websites deploy with CSP stapling, we turn on expect staples, see what the errors are, we pick those errors, and at some point we feel comfortable turning on a staple. And then maybe you start with Chrome, then we like drop off every Chrome client so we could turn it on there, and then but like, which happened so we could do happen. Like now, you know, HSPS, CSP, HPKP is a thing in this conference and so many people have it. Three years ago I was here and like CSP was the like, black box, no one knows. So things like, you know, we make progress, it's not bad. Uh, good final word, sorry, we have to wrap up. Um, I mean, we, we are happy to take questions, uh, you can find us, it's cool. But yeah, thank you. After the game, thanks a lot, thank you.